Hey guys, what's up? John here from flyatmikealpha.com and today we're going to go ahead and demystify weather radar charts for you. So radar summary charts, what they are, how to use them, and what they're going to mean to you as a private pilot, instrument pilot, commercial pilot, or even an airline pilot. So for starters, to access the radar summary chart, we're going to go ahead and go into observations because that's what we're looking at. We're looking at observation of radar on aviationweather.gov. So we always like to use that official source for weather, aviationweather.gov. We can see here a nice little graphical representation of the past radar. And we have the time in Zulu up here, the 5th of December, 2017, and the just past hour or so of what the actual radar is showing. So now it's important to know that radar, what it really is, it stands for radio detection and ranging. So that means they send out radio waves to then bounce off the water droplets, which are rain, and detect not only where they are, but how far they are from the station. And then they build a pretty picture with that. And this pretty picture here is actually built off multiple radar stations all around the country. And it's a composite image. So we see that the rain is moving. That doesn't mean that there's not weather in other areas. Radar is only going to detect actual water droplets. So you could have a heck of a storm building up somewhere over the southern corner of Georgia. But if it's not actually in the mature stage where raindrops are starting to fall and in the dissipating stage, it's not going to show up. So by the time you see rain or any sort of radar returns, the storm has already reached the mature or dissipating stage where it's starting to return some water back to the earth. So this gives us a rough idea of what's happening. We can see some different colors here. And of course, we know the colors mean the different intensities. What's important to note is that there's no legal requirement for the intensities to match a certain color code. So depending on whether you use aviationweather.gov or if you use MyRadar or FlightAware or Intellicast or weather.com or any other weather service app or website, they can make it whatever colors they want based on the decibel returns, how loud the returns are coming off of the rain. And of course, the louder the returns, the more rain there is, the heavier the rain. So it returns more of the signal back to the station. So before we jump too far in depth here, let's go ahead and look at what the actual levels mean to us. These actual decibel levels mean. We'll always want to compare the color codes and what we see to actually what's depicted on the chart and the actual decibel levels. So the FAA was kind enough to put out this info uh, supplement for us that actually defines what light, moderate, heavy, or extreme precipitation is. So when you hear the term moderate or heavy precipitation from an air traffic controller, it's a standard term. It's a certain decibel return. It's not red or pink or yellow or green or anything like that. It's actually a physical level of rainfall. So when you're looking at other weather products, be very cautious of their scale they use to color code things. What could be red on somebody else's scale could be green on another scale or vice versa. So we see here 40 to 50 decibels is a rainfall rate of a half an inch or two inches per hour, heavy precipitation. Extreme precip is anything greater than 50 decibels in a rainfall rate of two inches or greater per hour. So let's go ahead and take a look back at that chart and see what we got here. So we actually do see some yellow and a little bit of red over 50 decibels here of rainfall along the leading edge of that front. So that's some pretty extreme precipitation falling there. And if we want to get a little bit more in depth here, we can look at certain single site radars. Like we said, this is a composite image. So we could click on the single site radar and we can see, okay, there's a little bit of rainfall in this area. It looks calm over here, but it really isn't. If we click on that, it's just that the radar station couldn't see over there. So it's multiple, multiple radar stations all combining up to make this return. We can see we got some red areas here that are well over 50 decibels, and that's really bad. Even things in the 20, 25 decibel range may be pretty bad for us on little airplanes. And even where we see blue or very little uh, radar returns doesn't mean there's not a lot of downdrafts or other hazardous conditions for little airplanes in those areas. Like we said, just because there's no radar return doesn't mean there's not bad weather there. It just means there's not actual rain falling or heavy rainfall there to return the radar back to the station, to return that radar beam to bounce it back. The next thing we're going to look at is RCM radar. So RCM radar, radio coded message. This basically comes from all those individual stations. They build this composite image for us. But the most important thing is it's showing the radar tops here. And the tops are very important to us along with the movement of the storms. So we can see up in this area over uh, Virginia, Western Virginia, 
that we have tops only to about 20,000 feet, so airliners could fly right over top of that, or high-performance airplanes could get on top. Out here, just about 17,000 feet are the highest tops, the highest radar echo returns. So probably not real heavy precip and not that big of a concern to us. Now, does that mean we could go fly through it in a little airplane? Well, maybe, but the visibility could be absolutely terrible. So now we're going to have to go ahead and go to forecast, area forecast, like we talked about in another video, to the GFA tool, and then see that, oh yeah, down here we have a convective sigmet all the way up to flight level 390. That's really bad. And up around here, we have some oh, VFR, marginal VFR, and IFR conditions. And if we want to just go ahead and look at that, we can see that, in fact, we have air mitts for uh, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, and Western Virginia, in that same area we were looking at, for IFR conditions, marginal VFR conditions. And, yeah, it looks like not a great day to fly VFR. If you're IFR, though, it could be okay. We obviously have to take a closer look at some other factors. But so far, we established that the rain's not super heavy in that area. There's no thunderstorms in that area. We don't see the thunderstorm sign up here. We just see low visibility and some rain. So it might be a good IFR day, probably a really, really bad VFR day. Going back over to our radar here, one of the things we want to know is when you hear the term Doppler radar, that simply means Doppler radar, it's the sense of where the water droplets are moving plus where they are. So Doppler radar can actually start to forecast the direction of the storm and also if there's any sort of rotation happening within those storms. So Doppler radar is great for forecasting if any tornado is going to be popping up in this area down here where we see this really intense activity. So just a quick side note to what Doppler means. Basically, it's a change in pitch or frequency. So it can hear that water droplet moving further or closer to the station. Similar to as you hear a change in pitch in a voice as it moves closer or further away to a microphone, or you hear an airplane making a different sound as it approaches versus when it's flying away from you because those sound waves are bunched up on the forward part of the object and stretched out on the back side of the object. Why is it so much more intense here than up here? Well, there's probably just a lot more moisture and heat down here, and moisture and heat are great ingredients for making some awesome convective weather. If we go back to this RCM, to the actual tops that we were looking at, we see these barbs here showing us the direction and the speed at which the cells are moving. So these barbs here, we can see this one's moving in this direction. The barb always kind of points to the direction it's moving. So it's moving to the northeast at 30 knots. Here we have one moving eh, mostly east at 30 knots. Here east at 20 knots. And buried in here, it's kind of hard to see with the top of uh, 200 over top of it, but this is actually moving to the northeast at 50 knots. That's a little flag there. And the flag denotes 50 knots. And then you could have the flag with 50 knots and then a few more barbs to denote even 60 or 70 knots. Here we can see the little barb and then four big barbs. That means uh, east-northeast at 45 knots. Now, why is all this weather happening down here would be a great question to ask. So let's go ahead and take a look at our prog charts. That's going to show us our front locations, and we'll talk about those more in another video. But as we scroll down here, we can see, oh yeah, there's a cold front pushing through the area, and it's acting to pick up all that extra moisture that's in the air, lift it, and that's your lifting force to create a bunch of nasty weather. This is the latest surface analysis. If we look at the actual prog chart going out 12 hours, we can see, yeah, there's some serious weather occurring down in the southeast U.S. along this frontal line. And also, some really nasty weather up here in Canada. We have these isobars really close together, so we can expect some windy conditions. The pressure's changing rapidly over a short period of distance. See really low pressure there. We can see that low pressure is pulling moisture off the lakes and creating a lot of snow up in those areas that lake affects snow. So to quickly wrap up here, guys, remember the barbs are the direction the storm's moving, the speed it's moving at based on the number of little barbs on there. The colors are the decibels, but remember to check the actual decibel legend here and compare that to that info advisory we had shown you earlier. Be sure to always check the time of issue because as soon as this stuff's published, it's already out of date and new stuff's already happening. So radar always has lag time in it with the exception of having an onboard actual radar scope installed on your aircraft anything you get in your airplane or to your ipad or to your computer is out of date sometimes there'll be a delay message on it if you have like a g1000 that radar sent to you through nextrad and through adsb all has delays on it by the time they actually receive the data code it and then transmit it to your airplane it's 10 12 15 minutes old and things change very quickly around bad thunderstorms like these. So really do not rely 
on radar that you're receiving in the cockpit to navigate your way around storms unless you actually have a radome bolted on your airplane, which is like a $100,000 option minimum. So if you're using your iPad or your G1000 to try to pick your way through storms, don't do it. Whatever you do, use all the resources you possibly have to build the best picture you can of what's going on out there before you make the decision whether to fly or not. So using the radar, using the GFA tool, using all these other things, SIGMITs, AIRMITs, all the weather products available here on aviationweather.gov and any other ones that you like to use on top of that, use everything you possibly have at your disposal to make the best decision you can about whether or not you should be going flying when there's any sort of weather out there. Any questions on this at all, guys, leave them in the comments below. Make sure you give us a thumbs up, like, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Keep up with our latest videos as they come out every week here. Be sure to check out our completely free online private pilot ground school at fly 8 Check out our Patreon page. We greatly appreciate all the support you guys give us. It really helps us out to keep this a totally free online resource for all pilots out there. As always, guys, if you can't fly every day, then fly 8 Be safe. We'll see you all next time.